Welcome back to 162. Uh, today we're going to finish up a couple of things from last time, and then we're going to dive into some uh, real details, um, kind of getting past the user level things that we've been working on. Um, if you remember from last time, we talked, gave you a brief introduction on networking, and uh, we'll talk a lot more about this later in the term, but for now, the key thing to get out of this was the different namespaces involved with networking. Uh, thinking of host names like www.eecs.berkeley.edu as a namespace for communication is certainly a really good way to do that, to, uh, it's a good way to think. And we'll talk more about DNS later in the term. But basically, these host names get translated into IP addresses, which are the uh, lower level namespace for the internet. And uh, this is an IPv4 address, which is the most common, each one of these things being 250, uh, 0 to 255. Uh, we're not talking about IPv6 right now. And then also, in addition to IP addresses, were port numbers. And the port numbers have uh, well-known meanings in many cases, like port 80 being the one for websites. Some of these other ones are randomly assigned as another part of a connection. And we talked briefly about connections last time as well. I'll recall that. We talked about sockets, which are an abstraction of network I.O. queue. And it's kind of one end of the queue, and uh, or one end of the connection. And it's, uh, so basically, it's both a sender and a receiver. You have two sockets on either side of the network that communicate, and suddenly you have a commu uh, communication. And these were first introduced in uh, 4.2 BSD. And we talked through how you use sockets to set up a communication. And basically, the server, this is a client-server way of looking at things, the server sets up a listen socket first. And that listen socket ends up being bound to the port of interest, it's like 80 if it's going to be a web server, and then it calls listen until somebody connects. And then when it connects, it ends up getting one end of a new, uh, when it calls accept, it gets one end of a new connection. And then on the client side, it creates a socket and uh, says kind of what server it wants to talk to and performs a connect to actually get to the server. So here was the uh, diagram that I thought was particularly useful. So here's the server socket. It starts by binding to the port, namely 80. And then as soon as the client sends in a connection request, uh, the socket recognizes it because uh, the server has uh, listened to that socket. The, uh, the socket wakes up, allows the server to do an accept, and now suddenly we have a connection. And um, Basically, the thing to remember about this connection was it was a five-tuple. We said that as well. It's two IP addresses, two ports, and a protocol. And for now, think of the protocol as just TCP IP. So were there any questions on this? Yes? So uh, that's... That's an interesting question. They're kind of different types of sockets. So uh, the question here was, are these on the same port? And um, if you notice the fact that these communication sockets, the green ones, are really about five tuples, they're not really on a port. They're, uh, they're connected specifically with another socket by a five tuple. So the only one that you really say, think of as being on port 80 is that gray one. But when the connection gets set up, one of these, the server port will be 80. The address will be the server's IP address that that connection was made to. So yes, the server port part of this uh, socket connection is going to be 80. But that's really specifying this full connection. And it's really only this guy that's actually bound to 80 from an incoming connection standpoint. Yes. Yes. So if you have, if the client makes two connections to the same server, the things that are going to be the same about those connections are probably going to be the server address, the server port, and the protocol. So the only thing that could be different is either the client address or IP address or port. 
And so what actually, assuming for a moment the client doesn't have more than one IP address, it's the port that's different. Okay, and this connection process, I, I didn't go through this in great detail, but part of the client making a connection is that uh, there's a random client port or a, diff a unique client port that's assigned every time a connection is made. Yeah, good. Any other questions? And that, by the way, that's in this, uh, where did I have that here, this space down here. You know, there's, uh, ran you know, that's where the random port space are to make those connections all unique. Okay. Good. Um, so here was our final uh, web server that we put together, where you actually saw what happened here is the client, the uh, server starts by creating the server socket and binding it to the address, uh, which is a combination of uh, an IP address, the host IP address and a port, say 80, goes to a listen. The listen comes up uh, when somebody has actually requested it. Uh, to make a connection, and why does that happen? Well, because the client created its client socket connected to the server. This connect operation sends, starts a protocol that goes back and forth between them, which once the connection's made, then uh, the listen call is going to come up and allow the server to accept the connection. At that point, we've got a socket that spans the two client to server. And notice that the final thing we did here was we actually forked off at that point, a separate child to handle the connection. And um, that child immediately closed the listen socket because it doesn't need it anymore. And the parent immediately closed the connection socket because it doesn't need any more. And then the parent goes back and listens for another connection. Okay, And that was kind of how we get a web server that handles lots of connections. Were there any questions on that? And here was actually the code kind of that showed the server part of this. So the server does a listen on the socket. And this listen is going to block until some new client actually connects, at which point uh, the uh, server doesn't accept on the listen socket. And what comes back is the new connection socket. So now notice how we've got two open file descriptors, one that we're listening on and one that's the new connection. So when we go ahead and do this fork, what you see here is in the parent process, we immediately close off the connection because we don't need to deal with it. The child does. So when we do a fork, both child and parent get both sockets, get both file descriptors. That's part of what happens during fork. And so the parent immediately closes the connection socket, and the child immediately closes the listen socket. And, uh, and then the parent basically is going to go back in this loop and do its own thing. What does the actual child do? Well, the child will go ahead and do a bunch of communication over that socket. And when it's done, it'll close it and it'll exit itself. And this will be the end of that particular child process, whereas the parent is just going to keep going in this wild loop. Yeah? So uh, these sockets that are being closed, um, I thought they were like in common. Like if they, you close like socket number X, then it will close socket number X every process that uses socket number X. No. So what the close has done is the close has closed uh, a given process's uh, association with that socket. The socket doesn't actually get completely closed until the last uh, user. Yeah. So it's, uh, there is a, a notion of uh, basically doing reference counting on the sockets to kind of see when it's finally closed. But yeah, you're right. That, that would be kind of bad if the child could close off the listen socket. Yeah, go ahead. So if the client sends multiple requests, there are several different ways that that gets handled. Uh, but what I've shown you here, basically each request will be a different connection request and it'll have a different socket associated with it. And so you could actually have more than one open socket connection at the same time using different ports and then as a result be able to download uh, in parallel, different parts of, say, a web page. OK, good. All right. Any other questions? 
It's amazing how such a simple piece of code sort of gets across a lot of ideas here, right? Um, and some of the things that we didn't talk about, which are pretty simple, but um, one of the things you will encounter when you get to play with uh, Homework 2 and deal with the web browser is, for instance, things like addresses, okay? So there is a structure uh, called a server address, and one of the things the, the uh, server is going to need to do to bind to port 80 is it needs to set up one of these addresses before it does that actual binding to, to generate the listen socket. And that binding says, for instance, that the, uh, the family of that address is uh, what's called an AF underscore INET, which is basically an internet address, IP, uh, before. The, uh, the family is going to be, uh, or excuse me, the actual address is going to be what's called an in adder underscore any, which uh, at first glance seems a little strange because it's basically the server saying, I will accept uh, incoming requests on any address what that says. If you think that through a little bit, it really says I'll accept requests on any address that I have a, a physical um, interface to. Usually that just says my own one internet address, but if I actually, turns out I'm a server with several different network cards, that particular in or any actually says that this particular server will respond to anybody who connects to any of my IP addresses I cur uh, currently have on this particular device. And that's why uh, nobody ever bothers to figure out what my actual address is and put it in here because in that or any just does the right thing. And then finally, we have to say what the port is. And that will be, for instance, 80. And notice, by the way, that I say this uh, HTONS uh, parentheses port 80. And uh, does anybody know what H2NS means? Yes. It does have to do with endianness. What does H2NS mean? That's right. Host, Host to network S. <laughs> yeah, basically what that's doing is, uh, is basically putting it in special network order, which is, uh, I think it's big endian, but it's basically a standard across the whole net. doesn't matter which machine you come from, everybody's in the same order, and that's basically the deal with the fact that machines are different in this, okay? And so uh, in at or any is already in network order, but if this had actually been an IP address, we would have to potentially do something with that to, to, to change its order. All right, and then of course on the client side, the problem is the client doesn't actually know what the IP address of the server is, and so here, what for instance, you might, uh, if you were to look at code, you might have something like a build server address function, which has, this is the server address structure we were just looking at, this is a pointer to one that you've allocated, but here's a host name string, so that might be www.google.com or whatever, and what port number you want to connect, this might be 80 or 443, depending on whether you're doing regular uh, browsing or using HTTPS, and inside here, I didn't want to go in great detail, but you're likely to do something like get host by name of that host name, and what comes back is a host entry, and assuming that it wasn't null, namely you didn't ask for a non-existent server, then we can go ahead and pull out the IP address from this host entry, which is kind of what this code is doing, and when we're done, we have resolved the thing we're looking up that's the host name into an IP address, and then we can use that outgoing serve adder uh, for later parts of the connect. Okay? So I don't want to go in great detail on this, but I just want you to know that there are these functions that do things like resolve a host name into an IP address. Okay? All right. So unless we had any other uh, comments or questions on this particular example, I'm going to now dive into our, uh, start getting some real details in here. Is there any other questions? Okay, so you should have enough to, start uh, definitely playing with homework, homeworks one and two. Um, so, uh, you know, we've actually covered a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it may seem a little surface level, and it may seem like we've gone too quickly, but that's okay. The key idea of these first few lectures has been getting um, some ideas and, and words into your, into your brains so that you can pick them up later and some basic uh, associations at the beginning here. So this was kind of our goal in the first couple of lectures was to get you going. Okay, and, and uh, 
I understand that also in sections, you know, we typically have a vocabulary list you go through and do some discussions of that too. So this is all about getting you uh, to understand the nomenclature. And this is really, we're, we're going to now take kind of a spiral approach out. So we've been working in this middle bubble of giving you an introduction to a bunch of OS concepts with a, enough uh, detail that you can do the individual homeworks and start actually using the concepts. And now we're going to dive in under the covers and see how they're actually implemented. Okay, so that's where we're going. And uh, let's go back to the process now and, and deal with processes and threads in a much more detailed form. And I want to first say, what is a process again? So an a process is an operating system abstraction to represent what is needed to run a single program and the traditional one, notice the word traditional up there, had no concurrency in it and basically had uh, a single thread inside of it. Okay, and we, we usually bring, sometimes we sort of debate whether to even bring up what a traditional Unix process is. The reason I do this is uh, it's very easy to get confused if you read old textbooks or you read uh, even some newer textbooks and they say, well, a process has... Uh, you know, it has some protected memory and uh, runs uh, a single, you know, something. Maybe they don't even say thread, but it runs a single program. Okay, and, and basically in this uh, traditional view, there's no threading, multi-threading. There's just one thread in each process. But there are two parts to this, and I wanted to point them out. The first one is something that can execute code and the other part is the protected part, which is protected resources like memory and I.O. state, file descriptors, whatever. Okay, so there really are these two pieces. There's the things that execute, and then there's the protected domain. And what we're going to turn this into again, and we've already done this once, and we're going to do it again, is the protected resource portion is like a container. Think of that as, you know, you go to the container store and you buy one of those clear plastic bins. That's the protected resources, it's the memory protection, it's the, the file descriptors, and we can put file descriptors and memory into that bin, and it's now protected from the other bins when we put it on the shelf. The other thing we can throw in there is threads, which are going to be the execution portion. Okay, so a process has, uh, is a, is a um, container that contains these protected resources as well as some threads. Okay. And now if we go back and we say, all right, how do we actually have more than one process running at the same time? We sort of said, well, we multiplex them on the processor, but let's go down a little bit more. One of the things that's important here is what's called a process control block in pretty much any operating system you run into. And this is really some memory that's allocated inside the kernel that serves as a snapshot of everything about the process. So when the process isn't running, everything you need to know about the process is in the process control block including what were its registers, what was its PC, uh, all of the, what's its stack pointer, all of that stuff is in here, all right, uh, so that if we need to put it to sleep, we put all the, uh, the information in the process control block. If we need to wake it up, it's all in the process control block, all right? And now we can give CPU to different processes by manipulating the process control blocks. Okay, and this is just showing you some of the things that can be in the process control block. This is very operating system dependent. Um, but, uh, and now the interesting question about how to multiplex these is how to switch between different process control blocks in a way that preserve it, preserves, excuse me, the protection. Okay, so for instance, uh, each process gets its own memory space, which means that uh, when we go from process to process, we're changing the memory mapping. Or each process, um, well, anyway, we'll talk, we'll talk more about this in a little bit. So uh, how do we do this? Well, I showed you this before, but this is a context switch. So process one is running for a little while, or process zero, excuse me, is running. And then something causes us to go back to the operating system. We'll talk a little bit more about those some things in a moment. And the operating system maybe makes a decision that that process has had enough CPU, in which case we save everything we care about process zero into pro the process control block. We reload all the state from process one, which is the next one, and then we now return 
But when we return from the operating system in this case, we're returning to process one instead of process zero. So process zero went into the operating system. We come out in process one. All right, and then process run one runs for a little while. Then we dive into the kernel for some reason. We save its state. We pull all the state for process zero back into the machine, return, and now we're executing process zero. So you can kind of see how we go back and forth now between processes zero and one doing this multiplexing. And all of this stuff in the middle here is context switch. And in some sense, it's all overhead. So ideally, that stuff would be zero time. But of course, we know nothing is zero time. And so the more uh, time it takes to do this, the less time we have to do what we might have been actually trying to do with the processes. OK, so it's pure overhead. All right, is everybody with me? Now. Uh, so, and, and uh, we'll talk about several ways to reduce this overhead. You know, we can basically be saving and storing less state. That would be one way to do it. That's kind of where threads come into play. We could uh, put some hardware at it. That's multi-threading through, uh, or hyper-threading. So there's lots of options there. So let's look at what a process does when it's in the kernel. So it's got a life cycle. So when you first create a process, like through fork, OK, it it's new. OK? That's kind of makes sense. Once that new process has been created, what do we really mean there? It means we've created a process control block for it. We've found it some memory. We've got all its uh, register state initialized in the process control block. And it, once it's finally a, a valid process, then we can admit it into the system for executing. And in the system really kind of means put it on somebody's ready queue so that it can execute when the CPU becomes ready. So just because we've created a process doesn't mean it's actually executed any instructions. OK, and once it's uh, ready, then potentially the next time that there's a scheduler decision, maybe it'll be pulled off the ready queue and actually loaded into the processor, and now it's running. OK, and then sometime later, there will be an interrupt of some sort or whatever, in which case we go back to the ready queue, and we're not running anymore. Now, the fact that we're not running doesn't mean that somebody's not running. And so probably we're on the ready queue, but somebody else is running. OK? And then, of course, we do this for a while. And then at some point, maybe we decide to do some I.O. I want to read from a disk. Well, reading from a disk is a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. How many instructions worth of time? OK, a million, good order of magnitude, all right? Very good. You caught that from a couple of lectures ago. Uh, varies plus or minus a few orders of magnitude, but uh, when it comes to something that long, we can be astronomers, right? And um, so we're not going to hold up the processor while we're doing the I.O., so we actually get put on a different queue, the wa a waiting queue, which is different from the ready queue. The ready queue is saying, well, I am actually ready to run, so put me on whenever you can. A waiting queue says, gee, I'm not ready to wanna run. I'm actually waiting. Sometime later, the I.O. completes. We get put back on the ready queue. And da, 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 da. and finally, we finish. We execute exit. And at that point, what happens when we make an exit call? Yeah, go ahead. They're actually queues, OK? And, and uh, I'll show you why in a second. But you need to, in some sense, every process control block needs to be kept track of somewhere. So it's sort of like, uh, if I didn't have queues to put them on, I'd have a memory leak and I'd lose my processes. You know, they go into a black hole somewhere. Oh, OK. Just because I say queue doesn't mean it's FIFO. No, OK, good, good question. In fact, I'll, we'll address that in just a sec. Good question. Yeah, Q is just holding things in a place. OK, FIFO is a scheduling algorithm off the Q. So that's a good, that's a good distinction to make. OK, yes, go ahead. Uh, 
That's a really good question. So if one thread or process we're really talking about right now kills another one or, or whatever, right? So um, what actually typically happens is even in those instances, the thing wakes up long enough to exit itself. Uh, and so um, I think in most instances, you're going to see that even if somebody sort of one process kills off another one, that the process that's been killed off actually goes to run for just long enough to be exit to exit. Um, I don't know that there's a anything more than a philosophical difference between those two things, but you know I do believe it runs. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, so you do sleep, might be a system call or something like that, for two seconds. So, um, and then you wake up, you get put on the ready queue. Uh, it's pr in principle, if you're way overloaded, it's possible you won't run immediately, that's true. Um, however, the context switch time, which is kind of the typical time uh, cycle for going between running and ready, is not something we've talked about, but that's usually between 10 and 100 milliseconds, so it's not going to be a lot of time unless, unless you've got you know, hundreds of processes waiting to run, in which case your machine is kind of dead anyway because it's, you know, nobody's running. Um, and so finally, I wanted to say, uh, you know, once we do the exit call, we're terminated. And by the way, we can be in a terminated state for a while. What do we call that state? There's a very popular TV show about this now. That's the zombie state. Isn't there like a zombie apocalypse TV show that's uh, very popular these days? I was just hearing about it. But anyway, well, there is The Walking Dead, but there was something. Oh, it is. That is The Walking Dead is what I'm thinking about. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> very good. So um, I have to admit I haven't seen it, so I apologize. Um, the uh, thing to be that's interesting about this is why, why would a process stay stuck in the terminated state for a long time without going away? What are we waiting for? Yes? We're waiting for the parent to read its return code. That's great. Because the return code from exits put in the process control block, so we don't want to get rid of the process control block until that return code is put somewhere. Okay, So that's exactly why we might stick around in the terminated state. So I wanted to just throw out this particular diagram. If you imagine that the process control blocks of all the processes in the system are somewhere, what we're really saying is they're kind of flying around in a whole set of queues. So every process control block is in some queue. This idea of the ready queue and running is really that um, you know, those things that are actually running kind of go from the ready queue to the CPU, and then the timer goes off, and they kind of go like this. But there's many other queues, like I do I.O., or I create a new child. In that case, what actually happens is maybe the child executes a little bit, and then we both get put on the ready queue. Or if I'm actually waiting for some sort of communication from another process, I might go on a wait queue waiting for a signal or something like that. So there's lots of queues that I could be waiting on, but it's really only this ready queue that says I'm uh, immediately ready to have uh, CPU thrown at me. OK? Um, so the ready queue uh, and various other I.O. device queues, basically when a thread isn't running, it's on some scheduler queue of some sort. So what's interesting here, perhaps, is that the ready queue is a queue that has a linked list of all the things that are ready, or you know, who knows what the exact structure is. The point, though, is that this is not necessarily a FIFO queue. This is a queue that gets scheduled according to some scheduling algorithm. And it could be, when we start talking, we're going to talk a bit about real-time scheduling later in the term, it could be that things are in a certain order, but we want earliest deadline first, and there's something in the middle that has a deadline that's the earliest, and that's the one we'll pull off the queue. So the pulling, deciding which one to pull off the queue is the scheduling algorithm. That's exactly what scheduling means. And when we come to I.O., there are all these other things. Okay? And in the case of I.O., there's uh, you know, 
device specific reasons, like for instance a disk, it may be that we have a bunch of requests out, so they're all sitting on that wait queue. The first one that comes back, we pull that guy off of the queue. Okay, so the scheduling of pulling things off of the disk queue may actually depend on when the results are ready. Okay, not necessarily FIFO. Okay, so um, any questions on that? Yes. Oh, what's with the grounds? That's null. That's what happens when you have an electrical engineer writes down null. <laughs> and actually, if you don't have it ground and it's floating, then you have all sorts of weird things happen. You know, electrical sparks mess up the CPU, and it's just bad. Yeah, those null symbols mean, uh, those uh, ground symbols mean null. Um, any other questions? I should change that someday, but... That's a, has anybody else seen ground symbols for null? I've actually seen that in places, but okay. Uh, so group signups, we're past, uh, we're past the deadline for dropping, and uh, group signups, uh, the, the form I understand from my TAs are going to be out by Friday at the latest, maybe tomorrow even. Um, your groups need to be finished by Monday, so we definitely need to see, um, see sign up. And we're actually probably going to say we'd like to see it Monday uh, at the beginning, you know, like by noon or something, okay? So we want to see this earlier on Monday. Um, the forum will kind of ask which section you attend. Ideally, what will happen is all members of the group are going to attend the same section. And part of this is making sure that your TA knows who you are. Okay, now we're not going to enforce that uh, like we have in other terms, but you should think through that carefully because it'd be good for you to be in the same section because that's a good way to make sure that your TAs know you. Okay? Um, now, I did manage to find a room. I said I didn't last time, but we managed to find one. So we're actually going to move one of the Friday 10 to 11 sections. And the reason we're going to do that is because right now that we have two sections on Friday from 10 to 11, and between the two of them are about 15 people total, which is just, you know, not good use of TA time. So what we're doing is we're moving one of them, and we picked one, whatever one's in 3102 Echeverry is getting moved to Thursday, 12 to 1. This does not mean that you're forced out of the Friday 10 to 11. In fact, you know, ideally, we'd have more people that go Friday 10 to 11. So those of you that really love Friday 10 to 11, there's, a, there's another room across the hall. So we're not kicking you entirely to the curb. But we would like people to start pot potentially using this new one on Thursday. And the really key thing about all of this is uh, oops, um, you want your TAs to know you. So if you are in a super inflated size uh, um, section, then they're going to have a lot more trouble knowing you, and that's an important part of the participation grade. So it's probably in your best interest to move out of the really big uh, sections. Okay, any questions on this? Yes? Well, it's... Uh, the thing is that your um, TA that's... Uh, Handling the, core, the uh, projects is going to be in that main section, and so it's sort of good they see your interaction from a bunch of different ways. It's just part of getting them getting a better handle on you, uh, which is good. It's always good. It's always good for your TA. I, I would say it's very rare that knowing your TA or having interaction with them is a bad thing. So, um, Finals, conflicts, make sure I know any more this week. Um, need to know your TA, said that out of order. Uh, last thing I did want to say, uh, and we've had some postings, but we've had, I wanted to say uh, this in person. We've had a few cases where there's been Piazza postings that were long and multiple uh, postings from the same person over the course of, you know, half an hour might be you know, six, seven, eight postings from the same person. Sometimes the post is sort of, I can't figure this out, and then 10 minutes later, oh, I figured it out. <laughs> okay, you should reserve Piazza for questions you've spent some time thinking about, okay, trying to figure that out. And one of the things I wanted to point out is one important part about an operating systems class is learning your tools for figuring out information. 
And one of the big tools in Unix, or Unix variants, which is what we're dealing with, is the man command. And man, man is man amazing. So man basically gives you all the information about commands and system calls and, so th and things like that. And furthermore, you can even type something like man something into Google, and it'll give you a man page. So you don't even have to be running on a, uh, you know, on a Unix shell when you type man. So this is an example of a command you can find rather useful. Um, often, oftentimes you can find, if you're trying to figure out how a library function should work or whatever, you can often find those easily on Google as well. So get used to your tools. Yeah? I have a Sure. The textbook actually is, um, I would say, uh, going to be pretty useful tool. Um, because a lot of what we're going to be covering is in the textbook. Um, okay, so, I mean, what I mean is, like, if we're attending lecturing or anything, going to discussion, like, is it really that important that you're giving, like, basic things in basic programming? Well, uh, I think the 50, 60 page thing was, here's uh, parts of what we're covering today for the first few lectures. It'll be less. Uh, I apologize with the 50, 60 pages. There's a pretty heavy read, read load there, and that was mostly about skimming. We'll be, I'll be a little more focused about this as we go on. And my second question is, like, how useful do you think it is to maybe, like, look at, say, the kernel code for, like, you know, the ES or the free ES and do that in conjunction with the context of I don't know. I think looking, if you have a good source to some code preloaded, that's always useful to see a different point of view. Everybody implements a little differently. I think Pintos is kind of our source uh, that you should be able to look at. But um, I'm certainly not going to dissuade you from having a Linux distribution to take a look at stuff. Now, what you're not allowed to do, we kind of talked about this before, is you're not allowed to directly copy things out of some other distribution into your homeworks or things like that. Um, but uh, certainly, you're allowed to use resources. Yeah. So, okay, so the, the dinosaur book is not um, being used as much in this class, but the occasional postings are OSC something or other. Those are actually dinosaur posting uh, references. Yeah, but I, I find hard book or the variety Oh, oh you, okay. You find the dinosaurs exciting. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will try to add a little more spice into your reading. Um, I would, say, I would say that uh, the OSC book we're not really using because it has a tendency to be a little oblique in the way it goes after concepts. And so this one, the one that we've selected is a little bit more clear, but um, I will try to get some more references in because there are, you know, most of the concepts we cover are in both places. Okay. Good. Okay. So... I think oblique is the right way to, nah, anyway, we'll think of, I'll think of a good word. So let's go back to processes again. So modern processes with threads uh, basically go after what we really kind of talked about, which is what is a thread? A thread is a sequential execution stream within the process. And sometimes threads, confusingly enough, and I'm just wanting to put this out there for you, are often called lightweight processes. That is a really bad term. In fact, uh, you know, if I ask on the final or the, the one of your exams, what's a really bad term for thread? You could say lightweight process. But I just wanted to put it out there because it's been used. But basically, uh, there's no protection between threads, and uh, process is still the container. Okay, and. So now a process has multiple threads in it, okay? And a multi-threading is really a program made up of a number of different concurrent activities that has th multiple threads in it, okay? And, and uh, multitasking is an old ADA term. And again, why do we separate this concept of thread from the process? Well, basically the thread is the execution concurrency part and the, the um, the rest of the process is the protection domain, okay? It's the container, okay? And so here is a way to look at those two things. Here is an, a, a traditional 
pro heavyweight process with only one thread in it. It's got code, data files, it's got register and a stack, and a single thread. Looks pretty sad in there all by itself. Here is a more modern one in which we have code, data, and files that are shared across all of the threads, but every thread has its own space for registers and stack, and uh, there are many threads that are working together inside of that one process. Process is the container, the threads are the execution component, okay? Hopefully uh, this will make sense eventually. So threads encapsulate the concurrency, and the address space portion, for instance, encapsulates the protection, okay? And so threads are the active part, the address space portion of the process is the passive part. And if we do this right, these threads can't mess up this thread and vice versa. Okay, the threads in a given process can screw each other up, but they can't screw up threads from another process. That's what the protection is. Okay, and so why do we want to have multiple threads per address space if the threads, these threads are not actually protected from each other? They can screw each other up. Why would we even want this concept? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Threads are cheaper, okay? And when one thread communicates with another, since they're all sharing the same address space, they can just read and write memory. So they can have, diff you know, they can have a, an object in each of them reading and writing it, and there doesn't have to be sort of cross-process communication, which can get tricky. Now, we can do shared memory between processes, too, but we'll talk about that later. The other thing is the the uh, switching between threads inside of a process is a lot cheaper than switching between processes because the process switching, you actually have to reestablish the protection domain, a different one, for the new process in order to start it up. Okay, so there's more work in switching from one process to another than there is from one thread to another. Okay? Now, so what's the state of a thread? Well, we had a process control block, right, for processes. So the state of a thread basically is going to be similar, but now there's these thread states uh, have shared uh, aspects to them. So basically all threads in a process share the memory. They share the I.O. states, like such as file descriptors, network connections, et cetera. And then private to each thread is kept in a thread control block, which has things like the registers and the program counter and the stack pointer and so on. Yes? Well, you don't necessarily, though. So that, the nice thing about this is if I have one thread doing I.O. and the other thread's doing computation, I can put just the one thread asleep. So it's, just, it's actually the opposite of what you just said. By having two threads in a process, I can have one of them sleeping waiting for I.O. while the other one's still computing, and that's actually an advantage. Whereas with a process, I only have one thread of control, so when the process goes to sleep, there's nothing else running about it. Yes? Uh, when you work with threads from like high level languages, like in, I don't know, Python or Java, like you try to pack into the SD methods, but how close is that to what's actually like happening here? Like how much are you actually able to, I don't know, like is there like disconnect at all? Or? No, so that's a great question. So the threads that are provided by higher level languages, do they map to what I'm talking about? So abstractly, they completely map. And I'm going to talk, uh, depending on how far we get here, I'm going to talk different types of thread packages. And different languages put thread implementations, kind of some of them in the kernel, some of them in the user level. So it depends kind of where your threads are even implemented. But that's a great question, which hold on to it if I don't answer it later in the lecture or by uh, next time. Yes? So again, same question, or same answer from the slightly different question, which is it depends on how the threads are implemented. So the OS might be doing it, or the OS might not. So let's hold that question for a little bit later. Those are good questions. You guys are thinking this through. I like it. Any other questions? So that answer was depends, and this answer was depends. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Let's say I want to briefly make sure everybody remembers what a stack is. 
Anybody here remember what a stack is? Oh, boy. OK, so what's a stack? <laughs> OK, so stack is a 61C thing, right? So let's look at a program here. Here's a program. This, uh, this function A basically checks and sees whether uh, temp is less than 2. And if so, it calls B. And then uh, after B is done, it prints something. Uh, procedure B calls C. Procedure C calls A of 2. Proceed and then we sort of define all of these. And then to start it all off, we call A of 1. OK, so basically we've defined three procedures, and we made one procedure call. And this is going to be the stack we look at. So remember, first of all, that the stack is um, a chunk of memory that's associated with each thread. And it's uh, not fixed size necessarily. And what we have is an actual register in the processor called the stack pointer. And if you imagine the stack pointer is pointing at the beginning at an empty stack up top, after we called A of 1, A comes in. We call A of 1. That means that the, uh, this argument temp is equal to 1. And what you see here is we get, um, we're going to start, we're going to call this uh, A. And as soon as A calls B, we have to make sure we remember what the original temp variable was for A. So before we call B, what happens is we push onto the stack the variable of temp. And the fact that when A returns, we actually want to exit this whole uh, process. OK, because we called A from here. And when A returns, we're done. And so we remember that on the stack. And so now we call B. OK, and what about B? Well, when we call B, B is going to call C. But B has got to remember to re when it's going to return the first time B is called, where is it going to return to? It's going to return to, and I just loosely said, you know, A uh, plus 2, which is kind of this where A was plus two more lines is printf. So we got to keep track that when B returns, it's going to return to this point in the code. OK, so why do we have to do that? Well, we could call B from lots of different parts of the program. And in this particular instance, we called B from this part of the A procedure. And we got to remember that when we come back from B, this is where we come back. So what is the stack doing? The stack is keeping track of the local state of the execution such that I sort of keep track of procedure calls and local variables. OK? And in, in particular, notice this interesting thing here. When I have B call C and C calls A of 2, I get down here and notice that now we have a different stack frame associated with A that's further down in the stack in which temp is 2, not 1. OK? Question, yes? So how does the computer know when to like, take a snapshot out of the stack? So the stack is really only, uh, you, well, this is a little bit of a lie, but we'll do it for now. The stack is really only used when you make a procedure call. It keeps track of what uh, local variables need to be kept track of. OK? Now, the reason that's a little bit of a lie is because when we actually call procedure A, what really happens is we come in with a certain stack frame pointer location, and the local variables are actually allocated on the stack right then and there. And so when we say, what is temp? temp is potentially on the stack frame from the very beginning. Yes? Wait, what if you have like some, some object that you're passing through that has to be fixed later on further down the stack? How do you have like a separate point that you can fix the state? Uh, unfortunately, that would require an actual example, because the answer there could depend a lot. So uh, for instance, if we were to allocate a local variable in A, and then pass a pointer for that local variable in through other procedure calls, yeah. then those, that pointer actually ends up pointing onto the earlier part of the stack. And the reason that's kind of OK is because that part of the stack isn't going to go away while we're deeper in the stack. Yeah. OK? So keep in mind the stack. So the stack allocates local variables. It keeps track of return addresses. And it basically allows us to manage the whole execution so that uh, we can do recursion. Remember recursion, Fibonacci? Wasn't that your favorite thing to compute? Uh, 
as freshmen the Fibonacci function, okay? Huh? Factorial. Oh, factorial as well. There's another one. Okay, the problem with factorial is you don't get too far with factorial. It uh, gets big too fast. Um, all right, everybody with me? Towers of Hano Hanoi, that's another one we used to do. Um, so does everybody remember, now remember what a stack is? Now notice, by the way, that a crucial aspect of the state of this thread is the contents of its stack and its current stack pointer, right? Because if I were to take, after I've gone all the way down to where I called A of 2, and I were to do a context switch right there, I would need to make sure that I had the stack pointer and that I preserved all of the contents of the stack so that when I come back, I restore the stack pointer and I get to pick up where I left off. So this stack pointer is a crucial aspect of what the state of the computation is. Question, yes? So when you froze up, right, for a process? Or for so uh, I had this question after my first lecture, too. So does a stack grow down and a heap grows up, or vice versa, and why is your diagram backwards? So the answer to that is yes. Heaps grow down, heaps grow up, heaps grow sideways. Um, the important thing, okay, I'm being a little bit facetious, but the important thing to note is that stacks and heaps typically grow in de opposite directions so that there's a hole in the middle. That's the really important part. Okay, and depending on what processor you're doing and what calling sequence you're doing, then it's quite possible, and most of the ones we're dealing with have the stack grows down and the heap grows up. So that's a great question. Why does the heap not overwrite the stack? And the answer is, uh, ultimately, there is no full, uh, real check that you can be 100% sure about. But the way that the stack grows down and the heap grows up is you start with no memory assigned or very little. And every time you try to grow up, if you run out of memory, you get a um, page fault and the kernel allocates a little more and you give some more to the, the heap. Okay, so assuming that you're behaving yourself, assuming the code is actually allocating sequentially going up and the stack is actually sequentially going down, we can put what's called a guard page in the middle there that if we ever do a page fault to it, we know we got problems and we can kill the process. But if you were to screw up your stack pointer and put it, point it into your heap or down below your heap, there's really not much to prevent you from doing this. No, because your stack pointer is a user mode register and your heap pointer is a user mode heap register. Now, you can't screw the kernel up that way, but you can certainly screw yourself up. <laughs> okay, so by the way, that's a great point. The philosophy behind processes and multiple threads in a process is it's okay to screw yourself up because you could write, a, you could write you know, an infinite loop. right? What you're trying to do is protect yourself against other things. That's number one and protect other things from you, that's number two. And number three, which is important, but not as important in the scheme of things probably from this standpoint, is it'd be great to debug, and it'd be great to be able to have a way of checking that that's screwed up, right? And so that's debugability, and that as long as you're not doing something really crazy with your compiler, you can probably get things to be pretty debuggable and catch most of these cases. Okay? Good. Yes? Yes, they all share the same heap and have separate stacks for multiple threads in a process. And the reason for that is that each thread, a given thread might allocate an object, and then another thread, it might write into the object, and the other thread reads from it, and that's exactly how you're getting the parallelism you're going after. So that's, that's actually considered a feature for them to share the same heap. Now, what's not a feature would be for them to share the same stack, because they're working in parallel, and that would just screw everything up. Yes? Okay, so we'll get to that in just a sec. That's a good question. So let's look at a motivational example. Okay, as, you, as far as you have figured out, by the way, pi is one of my favorite numbers. I mean, who, who couldn't love pi? Um, but suppose we write this program. What's wrong with this program? 
You'll never get to printing the class list, right? That's a, that's a flaw here, OK? Um, by the way, when I first started teaching, I was able to throw out the, uh, the original Star Trek episode. Anybody here a retro Star Trek person? Is there, are there any retro Star Trek? You, got, you should be. There is, a, there is an episode where Jack the Ripper, as a, a disembodied thing, has inhabited the computer and is cutting off life support. And the way they save the crew is they ask the computer to compute the last digit of pi, and it drives out Jack the Ripper. This is, a, this is classic. You guys ought to, you ought to see this episode. But anyway, moving right along, so what is the behavior here? Well, the behavior is the program never prints out the class list. OK? And how could we use threads? Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what thread fork work looks like, because there's many thread packages and so on. But we could do something like this, right? where loosely we say we fork a new thread to compute pi and a new thread to print the class list. And now, what does the thread fork do? Well, it starts some independent thread running. And what's our behavior? Well, do we see the class list? Yes. Probably interspersed with pi, right? And so um, because we're, now we've got uh, this multiplexing going on. And um, so you could say, well, I could do this with multiple processes. It's true. But we're doing this with just threads in the same container for now. OK? Questions? Oh, what happens if I do the print class list and then this thread exits? Then, um, so that depends a lot on which exit you use and what thread package you've got. So um, whether it actually exits the whole process or just this thread is completely uh, dependent. You could imagine both. Okay, in fact, you can do both. So the memory footprint of two threads, you could say, well, look at this. Here is in theory, and I think this is going at a question that was earlier, is what does the actual memory footprint look like? Well, remember, we've got a shared address space for both threads, or both uh, threads because they're in the same process. And so in principle, we've got two stacks and a heap. OK? And the problem with two stacks and a heap is it's no longer possible for them to both go to all the stacks and the heaps to go in different directions, because there's only two directions and we have three things. OK? So. This is an interesting challenge whenever you start getting into multi-thread packages. And in fact, because the two threads can overwrite each other's stacks because there's no protection, if this thread got into some sort of infinite recursive Fibonacci loop, it could easily sort of keep growing until it went into stack number two and screwed you up. Okay, And again, there are ways to protect against that with guard pages and stuff. But just be in, keep in mind that this is what it means to not have protection against between threads. All right. Let's take a brief break. We'll come back and continue. By the way, while you guys are breaking, I'm going to put up some actual thread operations like fork, yield, join, and exit. Um, and most thread packages have combinations of these. Either one seems fine to me. Give it a shot. But you're right, that's less cram, because when you look at it on the laptop, the other one is getting pretty strange. <laughs> 
All right. So we're back. By the way, I will say that all the original, uh, all the original Star Treks are available in HD on Blu-ray. What's amusing about this is they were originally shot in 35 millimeter, which means all of the detail was there. So when they transferred it to HD, it wasn't a down sample. But you can now see how cheesy all the little ca uh, consoles were. They're made out of cardboard. And all of those details are very obvious now uh, in HD. But it's fun to watch anyway. Um, by the way, there is a threading package which you're going to get to play with called uh, P-Threads, which is a POSIX standard for threads. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is that there are these standard sort of operations like fork, yield, join, and exit that are, pos that are parts of most thread packages where fork is the obvious create a new thread. Yield says, OK, I'm uh, giving up the processor for a little while. OK, and then join says wait until a certain thread is finished. So let's do, I want to briefly talk about scheduling of threads. So there's obviously there's a dispatch loop somewhere that sort of takes the set of threads and figures out what to do with it. And conceptually, this loop looks kind of like this. Run a thread, choose the next thread, save the CPU uh, for the current thread, start the new one, keep looping forever. And this is an infinite loop that just keeps grabbing the next thing to run. And you could argue, some people have, that this is kind of all that an operating system does, is it has this loop where it just keeps choosing the next thread and running it. OK? And probably, you, you know, when do you exit this loop? Well, I guess when you reboot the system or something, or crash. So let's look at what running a thread might look like. How do we run a thread? Well, we got to load its state, like the register's PC stack pointer, into the CPU, load its environment, if we need to, like the virtual memory space, and then jump to the PC. And the interesting question that comes into play here is, how does the dispatcher get back control? Because the thread is running itself. Okay, it's got the CPU. And I've got two possibilities here, which we loosely talked about, but I thought I would bring up. There's internal events and external events. So internal events are actually cases where the thread executes something like yield and says, OK, I'm giving up the processor for a little while. External events are things uh, that preempt the thread, like timer interrupts or other interrupts. OK? And um, internal events, by the way, are not just yield. A good example of an internal event would be a thread trying to do an I.O. operation that waits. That's another way to yield the processor. All right, so let's look at uh, internal events here. I've got blocking on I.O., waiting on a signal from another thread, uh, the, the thread executing some sort of yield operation. All of these are internal and voluntary. And so you could imagine that we had to write the compute pi thing this way, where we say sort of, well, true, compute the next digit, yield, compute the next digit, yield, compute the next digit, yield. If we were to build a cooperative thread like this, then this would play nicely with other threads. And in, interestingly enough, a lot of the original uh, personal computer style operating systems, including Mac OS, uh, Windows variants, a lot of them all made you do this. So if you forgot to put a yield in a, in a loop that went forever, you'd lock the whole system up. Okay? So this is probably not a very reliable way to make sure that, for instance, a virus or even a bug would not crash your system, right? Because basically, if we forget a yield, we got problems. Anybody else, by the way, know what's, uh, what's another bad thing about this particular code? How often do you yield? Well, do you? Actually, it turns out that uh, each successive digit uh, takes longer and longer and longer because you're doing an expansion. So what happens is you start out yielding quickly, and pretty soon you're like yielding, you know, every day, <laughs> every week. All right. So here is what we kind of look at for that stack. We're computing for a while. We yield. It traps to the operating system because the yield is a, is a system call in this case. And at that point, we call run new thread, and we do a switch to the next thread. And how do we run a new thread? Well, we pick the thread, and then we do a switch of the context. And then maybe we do some housekeeping that might be some cleanup. But 
what about, what is that switch, okay? Well, switch is kind of magic, okay? Switch is the magic. It might, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I have, uh, it, I'll show you switch in a moment, but um, switch is kind of an interesting piece of magic that's very uh, processor-centric. So let's look at the stacks for a moment before we talk about switch. So look at this code. This code has uh, A calls B, and B says sort of while true yield. Okay, so this is, I'm just putting A in there to give me a more stack. And what I'm going to do is have two threads, S and T, both running A. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, one processor. So thread S runs a while, ran A called B, and B is, you know, doing its while thing. It calls yield. And by the way, somewhere in this is going to be when we're done with yield, we return to this point so we can go back to the loop. That's all in the stack there. But yield goes into the kernel, that's what red says, and runs a new thread which calls switch, and switch, assuming this has been running for a while, pulls up the same point in thread T stack and then just does a return. Return, 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 return. And we're running thread T. And then T does the same thing. The switch happens, and then we return, return, return. We're running S. Now, this is, this is a kind of a weird thing. When you start talking about two threads running on the same CPU and switching them back and forth, the magic is really in the stack, okay, as well as restoring and saving the restoring the registers, because we have to make, you know, once we switched over to that other stack, once we start returning, from, uh, from the stack, we'll eventually end up returning from yield, and we'll end up returning from a different yield than the one that we entered. We entered S's yield, and we returned from T's yield, and run for a little while, then we enter T's yield, and we return from S's yield. Okay? All right, how's that for blowing your mind? So what does switch look like? Switch is simple, okay? Switch basically is just a procedure that saves out a bunch of registers into the TCB of the first thread and loads a bunch of registers from the TCB of the second thread and then just does a return. So a switch is a procedure call, except this procedure call, when we call switch, this return is returning off of a different stack, and so we call from one thread and we return into a different thread. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Kind of weird, right? Kind of cool, yes. Yeah, so I, if you notice, this switch is saying, here's my current thread and my new thread. So it's basically, I'm calling this from the, dis, the uh, thing that chose threads earlier. Okay, because it's sort of saying, here's what I'm running, here's what I want to change, and then when we call in here, it actually does the magic. Okay, yes. Well, what I've done here, which is a little confusing, and I'm not going to uh, go into it in detail now, is I've started this up such that S and T are already running and have been for a while. So assume that S and T have been running for a while, and all we're doing is switching back and forth between the two. There's clearly some startup where we sort of initialize S, and we have to get down in there. So that's so th don't worry about startup. Just think about the, sol the uh, steady state here. No, because the run new thread, we called the run new thread procedure call with T as the new thread. It goes through switch where T is the, the, uh, the source of the new TCB. We load those registers, and now magically this going from here to here is really about us changing the stack pointer and the registers, but we're doing that all in assembly language so that then when we return from switch, we actually return to the run new thread that was called a long time ago from T because we've got a new stack, and now we return our way back up the stack. Okay? Now, I, I'm going to leave you guys to ponder this a little bit. Go ahead. Yes? Is this a switch one switch by the red frame on the kernel stack? Yeah, the red things are, think of them on a kernel stack, yes. <laughs> well, it's this procedure I actually showed you a little bit earlier here. It picks a new thread and then calls switch. So it's a very it's a procedure that calls another procedure which is switch. <laughs>
Yeah. Yep, and then it calls run new thread, and assuming only S and T are in the system, run new thread can only pick the other one, which is why it's going back and forth. If we had other threads, then we'd have an interesting scheduler doing who knows what. Yes? Uh, is there a limit to the number of threads in a process? Is there a limit to the number of threads in a process? Sometimes, usually if you, put, if you uh, don't have an actual explicit limit and you allocate too many threads, the, the system just dies. Um, sometimes thread packages have explicit limits, not always. So that was a depends answer. Yes? Does PCB have to point to all the Yeah. So PCB will point to the thread control blocks. I'll show you a picture like that in a, in a moment here. Um, okay. I, I don't want to go any longer on that little switch back and forth, but I want you to think about what it really means to change out all of the registers and stack pointer of one thread and put the other ones you know, of, a stack, of another thread in and then return from where you called, you, you're suddenly you're in a different context and you're executing that other thread. So that's the interesting thing to think about. And I'm going to leave that with you. But I wanted to say something interesting here. What if you make a mistake in that little switch piece of code? You get really weird errors. Okay, so this is probably one of the most debugged piece of a kernel is the switch statement. Okay, because you, uh, if it screws up, you're going to get really weird failures. And the other thing is, is there some way to have an exhaustive test to make sure switch is right? And the answer is really no, there's kind of too many combinations, so you just got to be really careful. And there is an amusing uh, cautionary tale. There was this kernel called Topaz from Digital Equipment Corporation that was, uh, very clever. The person who wrote the code saved one instruction in switch, which, by the way, is important because switch is used every time you switch, right? It's pure overhead. They saved an instruction in switch by being clever, assuming the kernel never got bigger than a megabyte in size. And, of course, they documented the, this thing, okay? So it was well documented. What happened? Yes. Well, maybe they did, but they didn't read it for a long time, and they forgot, right? And they made the kernel bigger, and it got bigger than a megabyte, and that optimization suddenly led to a liability, and things were just flaky, okay? And nobody knew why it was flaky, and they went, and they debugged, and, oh, doggone it, that switch didn't work. This was not worth the optimization of that one extra instruction with a long-term view of the kernel, so... Um, cautionary tale. Moral of the story is perhaps, especially when you've got something that's at the core of what you're doing, you want to be maybe careful and simple rather than clever, because sometimes clever is not clever. Okay. Um, so here's some numbers. How frequently do you perform context switches? So a typical number to keep track of is 10 to 100 milliseconds is a pretty common time. Okay. And... Um, uh, if you were to actually look at some context switch times on modern uh, processors, three to four microseconds is kind of right there. Thread switching is a little faster than process switching by 100 nanoseconds, so that's not a huge amount, but it's there. Switching across cores is about twice as expensive. So there's this switch statement is pure overhead, and you can start talking about how expensive is it. And the context switch time increases pretty sharply with how much of the cache that you're changing. So what really matters here is if thread S uses a lot of caching and then you switch to thread T, T is going to mess up all that cache data. When you go back to S, maybe it's slower because you've got to do cache misses. Okay, So context switching can uh, often depend a lot more on caches and memory usage than it does on the raw uh, code of switch. But it's still raw. It's pure overhead because we want to be switching between threads, but we don't want to worry about the cost of switching between threads. Okay. Now, um, so what happens when a thread blocks on I.O.? If we use that same sort of schema I showed you here, we're busy doing some stuff. This thing is copying a file. It does a read. It traps to the OS to do the read. And at that point, the read, it declares that my, uh, my uh, disk is too slow to uh, let this thing wait, and so we basically just run new thread and switch. 
Okay, so you can go through the same kind of schema of what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah, so scheduling of threads versus processes is a very complicated issue, which we'll go into another, but great question, right? Because you can imagine you want to amortize the number of switches within the given process as much as possible so that you're not wasting time switching processes, but you also want to be fair. Whatever fair means. Fair is one of these funny words that we'll, uh, we'll spend a lot of time on when we get to scheduling, but great question. So um, anyway, and so this is a great place where I do I.O. and I voluntarily give up the processor. You can imagine that external events, uh, you know, if we never do a yield or I.O., we sort of never switch to anybody else, and that's why modern processors basically uh, do other ways to have the dispatcher regain control and external events matter. What's the biggest external event we've been talking about this whole time? Most important, to regain control. What kind of interrupt? What was that? Timer. Timer interrupt, most important external event from regaining control. OK? And so uh, and that's kind of something we've already talked about. We'll talk more about as we get further. OK. So what is this thread abstraction? I want to say a few more things before we end up here. The thread abstraction uh, is basically a programmer abstraction kind of says that there's an infinite number of processors that these threads are running on. And I don't have to worry about them. I just generate my threads. And now I can have all the parallelism I need. I can have I.O. overlapped with computation and so on. What's the reality? Well, the reality is there's a finite number of processors. And so the physical reality is I may have so many threads that most of them are sitting on wait queues and the ready queue, uh, and only a few of them are actually executing at any given time. And so now there's a pretty clear trade-off if you start programming with threads a lot as to you know, how many threads is it worthwhile to get uh, run, uh, started so that the overhead of the threads isn't sort of overarching uh, and not gaining me any benefit. So you have to think about that a little bit. OK. Um, so the programmer is also the difference, by the way, is when we talk about threads running, you got to keep in mind that the threads are not always running. So the programmer's view might be that I sort of uh, add 1 to x and add x to y and add 5y plus x to z. This may be what you think of as a programmer, but in fact, yeah, maybe this happens. You're lucky. They run right after each other. Or another execution is your thread runs this one for a little bit and then suspends while a whole bunch of other threads run, and then it runs these two instructions. Or it runs these two instructions, waits a long time, and runs this other one. So the thing is that threads are a form of concurrency, but they're not guarantee that you're going to run things, any particular group of instructions, one after another. Yeah? Don't we never, ever have that many because the process Well, both processors, and, both processors and threads have this problem, yes. Now, this is going to lead, by the way, to a discussion, which is our very next topic that's going to be coming up, of concurrency control which is how do we put the proper locking around certain sequences of instructions so that we don't get chaos? There's another question in here somewhere. No. OK. So, um, so lots of op, uh, different executions. I want you to not think that because you create a bunch of threads that they're ever going to execute in any particular way. So we could run thread 1 to completion, thread 2 to completion, thread 3 to completion. or if we have a multiprocessor, we could run all threads in parallel, or multi-core. Or we could run a little bit of one, then a little bit of two, and then a little bit of three, and they're arbitrarily interleaved. OK, so the existence of threads is not a guarantee on execution order at all. And this is going to be the most important thing we're going to have to deal with as our next topic, how to deal with that. So what's the life cycle of a thread? Looks very similar to a process. You create it. It's on a ready queue. It runs for a while. Maybe it exits, maybe it waits. Same sort of thing as a process. Except the question is kind of where is the scheduler for this? And we'll talk a little bit more, we'll talk a lot more about this next time. But if you notice, again, just to emphasize, shared versus uh, per thread state, multiple threads in a process all share the heap. They share the same global variables. Those are the variables you declare at the top of your C files. 
They share the code. Each of them, however, has their own thread control block, their own stack, their own registers, et cetera. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so a process is a container which has an address space, and we put threads in it, okay? And so each thread has a thread control block, uh, scheduling info, pointers, pointers to the, enclo uh, uh, the enclosing process, et cetera. All right. And I sort of, this was the picture somebody asked about. So basically, in principle, each process control block points to a bunch of thread control blocks. Okay. So I think that's what I wanted to say. We'll talk uh, a lot more about this next time. But in conclusion, we said that processes have two parts, the thread part and the concurrent, the, uh, which is the concurrency part, and the address spaces, which are the protection part. Concurrency is uh, accomplished by multiplexing the CPU in time, which is unloading the thread, loading a new thread. We talked about protection is really about restricting the memory mapping and so on. We'll talk more about that. And various textbooks talk about processes, but they're not always clear whether they're talking, what they're talking about. So for this class, we're going to say a process is the container. The threads are in the process. It can be one or more threads in the process. You guys have a good Wednesday. Don't forget to sign up for groups by Monday at noon.